You're listening to the LA Football Podcast. What is going on, Los Angeles, UCLA Bruins fans? Welcome to the LA Football Show right here on the LA Football Network, our city, our network. Not as excited to get into this past game, but I, the season's not over. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about the future and what now is in store for your UCLA Bruins after a tough loss to the Arizona Wildcats at the Rose Bowl on Saturday. Joining me to dive in, alumni, prestigious alumni, the madman Jamal Madney. What's up, man? How are we doing on this beautiful day in Los Angeles? Doing well, Ryan. Wish it was under better circumstances that we were talking, but always a pleasure to break things down with you and, and get into this. So grateful to be here, to be able to talk some great UCLA football with you and grateful that even though this game coming up doesn't quite have the same cachet as it did a day or two ago, it still is for all of the marbles for all intents and purposes. So excited to jump in it with you. Yeah, yeah, it's... um. Definitely, it was a, a tough, tough game. Just like hit the pit of my stomach. Just so, so rough. Um, before we get all into it, got to mention betonline.ag, our friends, partners, sponsors of the show. Head to betonline.ag today on your desktop or mobile device. Use our promo code BELIEVE, that's B L E A V, to get a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. You can bet on this Victory Bell game this Saturday. SC versus UCLA should be a fun one. And if you got a 50% welcome bonus, you got free money to play with, so you might as well do it then. BetOnline.ag, where the game starts. All right, Jamal. So, final score of the game was 34-28. UCLA was kind of playing catch-up ball game. It was a very back-and-forth game. Some mistakes by both teams. Um, some big stops by both defenses. Some bad uh, stretches by both defenses. The offenses stalled at times. It was a very exciting game to say the least and it came down to the final play as UCLA had a chance to win it at the end uh and honestly could have we'll get into it but I mean DTR had Mike had a Bobo open Jake Bobo open and just missed him unfortunately but what were your initial takeaways from this this tough loss yeah Ryan it was certainly heartbreaking as someone who has been a lifelong Bruin and Bruin fan it was a little all too familiar for me of losing a game before kind of the, the, the big game. I remember 2005, the last time we had a top 10 USC UCLA game. And in that situation, they were thinking it was going to be undefeated versus undefeated in those peak Bush liner years. And with UCLA, it was Drew Olson was the quarterback with Maurice Jones. Drew was the running back. Mm -hmm. And ironically enough, two weeks before the big game, UCLA goes up to Arizona, of all places, Tucson, and ends up losing 52-14. to 14. I remember the, the 2014 game with UCLA and Stanford. All UCLA had to do was beat Stanford to get into the Pac-12 title game. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. The 2013 game against Arizona State, win, and an opportunity to play for the Pac-12 title didn't happen. So we've seen this script a little bit too many times before, but in terms of narrowing in on the game, Ryan, a couple things. One is I think the team came out pretty tight and, and you could see that with Arizona jumping out 14 to nothing. And you could tell UCLA was sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place of not almost wanting to show too much emotion and too much effort and too much intensity. Cause it almost felt like they were trying to preserve and save for next week but at the same time feeling the expectation of needing to win this game to get to next week. And I think they just sort of struggled with the moment. It almost feel like, felt like at the start of the game, they just wanted the game to kind of be over and just to win however and just mm -hmm. sort of move on. They didn't look very present, especially early in that first quarter down 14 to nothing. The second big piece for me, Ryan, was that two-for-one opportunity at, at the end of the half and the beginning of the second half UCLA found their way from 14 nothing, tied it at 14, that great 51-yard completion to Hudson Habermel. It was 14-all. Arizona comes back and scores. But you still had that sense that UCLA dug themselves out of the hole. They're now within a possession. They're moving the ball. The separation is ultimately going to take place here in the second half. And that drive 
right at the end of the half where DTR is sort of lunging for that fourth down and in that process loses the football. UCLA comes up empty. And then that first drive of the second half, Nicholas Barmira misses the 46-yard field goal. So in that two-for-one opportunity, you come away with zero points. Even if you come away with two field goals, it's 21-20. And then ultimately when UCLA took that lead, 28-24, 28-24, it would have been a two-possession game and they would have had the opportunity to salt the game away and salt that tempo away with Charbonnet, who was absolutely unstoppable. And I think the third element for me, Ryan, the takeaway is this is now the second game that UCLA has played this year against this type of quarterback. And what I mean by this type of quarterback and Jaden Delora is we talk about the concept of dual threat quarterbacks a lot. The, the guys who can throw the ball and then the guys that who can run the ball. But there's a third dimension to great quarterback play. And those guys that are elusive enough in the pocket that can evade the rush and then extend a play by rolling left, rolling right to keep that option of throwing and running open. And Bo Nix was the first type of quarterback UCLA played in that regard. And now Jaden Delora was the second. And both times, the linebackers in particular have really struggled in that type of a situation. And what's been evident is the Latus, the Murphy twins of the world, while they are terrific pass rushers, they are straight line pass rushers. And so when they have to go horizontal and have to get a second rush or break containment because the quarterback is rolling out, they really have a hard time getting pressure on the quarterback. It puts those linebackers in no man's land and then really opens up the middle of the field. And we saw that in particular on that fourth and four play when UCLA was up 28-24 and Delora was able to dance around there and find Jacob Cowing cutting all the way from across the field for Arizona to take that lead 31-28. So while they played the Cam Risings of the world, who was more of a guy who could just run with the ball, and the Michael Penix Juniors of the world, who was more of a traditional pocket passer, these guys who are these elusive, evasive type of quarterbacks, but who aren't just going to take off and run at the first sign of trouble in the pocket, but who can dance their way to extend a play to keep that option open for running or throwing, UCLA is going to have to figure that out and figure that out fast because the next guy they're playing is probably the best of them all at doing that. So those were my three big takeaways uh, going into this particular week. Yeah. And, you know, going back to your second point, uh, I remember texting you uh, when that happened and just what a huge missed opportunity when they had the two for one um, chance. And, and I, I, I can't remember what I said exactly, but something like, Oh man, I hope that doesn't come back to haunt them. Cause it's like, you're, not only are they have the two for one opportunity, but they actually were driving and moving. It wasn't like they went three and out. They were in the other side of the 50 and had the chance to get points and then to not get points after the half as well. It was just in a game like that where stops were hard to come by uh, with Arizona and Arizona was moving the ball so well and play calling was great. And I think everyone, if they didn't know me and you have been saying this since now, SC's played them before and, and whatnot that Jaden Delora is a very, very good, talented quarterback. And, um, you know, maybe the second best or third best in the conference next season, uh, with DTR being gone. So we all knew what was potentially could happen in this game. And unfortunately it came to fruition. My big thing is this is what's so hard about college football in general, but also PAC 12 football. Have this been, maybe even if they were just in the big 10 already. Um, But for sure, if this was like NFL style rules or when the college football playoff is expanded, I wouldn't have been as mad about this loss because I think it would have woken them up and said, okay, we were, we were maybe sleepwalking through this game, looking at SC, we get that loss out of the way. And I think it would have really, I mean, I think it will still, but it would have really changed their season for a better trajectory with a loss like this. But unfortunately with the way college football is, and especially in the pac 12, this loss is so detrimental to anything they want to accomplish. Now we'll get onto it a little bit later in the show. They still have a very reasonable path to the Rose bowl college football playoff. I think is absolutely done, but they still have a very reasonable path to the Rose bowl, which I think beginning of the year, if you said that 
everyone would have been thrilled. So um, that is still in front of them, but it's just unfortunate when you see a loss like this. And I know the record for Arizona wasn't good, but we've been saying Arizona is a good football team. They're a dangerous football team. They're a team on the rise in the next few years. They're not quite there yet, but they're well coached by Jed Fish. We saw that on Saturday night. I think UCLA did not play their best football, but it wasn't that they just got completely outplayed by an inferior team. Arizona is a very good, talented team. Unfortunately, UCLA just didn't quite rise to the level they needed to in this one, like we saw them against Washington, like we saw them against Utah. And they kind of let the, the awe of playing USC a week later overtake them a little bit, I think. And as you kind of mentioned, they were sleepwalking through it saying, you know, we can come back. We have the talent. We'll get through this. Let's just get through this game. And then we can move on to the real game next week. And unfortunately, this game became the real game because it kind of ended their playoff hopes, essentially. Yeah, Ryan. And I think you brought up a great point of, uh, regarding Arizona and who they are. And we saw some of this in preseason on media day when we had a chance to talk with Jed Fish. We were wildly impressed with what he was building, what his vision for Arizona football was and where they're headed coming into this game, Ryan, they were three and six. Now they're four and six. But I think the key stat here was UCLA was their fifth consecutive ranked opponent. So they came in very Mm -hmm. battle tested, knowing what it takes to beat elite competition. And you could see that, that that experience, that collective experience over the last month of the season really bared some tremendous fruit. They were not overcome by the moment. They were not intimidated by the Rose Bowl venue, not intimidated by 12th ranked UCLA. And it was even more evidence of their poise and ability to hang on to a lead late in the game. So many times we see an underdog jump out ahead for a quarter, two quarters, three quarters, but ultimately when that favored team, especially that favored team at home makes a run, it ends up being that that underdog sort of crumbles under the pressure of the moment. And one mistake becomes three, becomes five, becomes seven, and then the game gets out of hand. Arizona was able to maintain their poise and hold on to that lead and then regain that lead even when they had lost it. And I think that team was a very different team than the unit that played USC three weeks earlier because this group had those experiences now to lean on and knew what it took to beat elite competition. So credit Arizona, credit Jed Fish. Their schedule was a murderer's row in the Pac-12, yeah. five consecutive weeks, and they were able to culminate the five weeks with finally getting over the hump and getting a victory. Yeah, yeah, that's a wild, wildly tough schedule. And it shows just how, in my opinion, how good the Pac-12 is right now. Yes. And it's it's for, for Pac-12 lovers, and I think we would have been had – you know, this news of the USC and UCLA going to the Big Ten, we would still love the Pac-12. Um, have to be very disappointed with these two teams moving because of what the state of the Pac-12, just on the football field, is. Obviously, yeah. all the off-the-field stuff is different. But all these programs, I mean, Washington, the way they've turned it around so quickly with DeBoer, they're you know now a top-15 team. Utah's a top-15 team. Oregon's a top-15 team. UCLA is still 16 after this loss. USC's top-7. And then you have Arizona on the rise. Arizona State is going to get things figured out when they get their new coach hired. And it's just like, man, and then the whole thing's going to blow up in their faces. So it's very unfortunate for a lot of the Pac-12 because of how good these teams are. And in my opinion, and it's not, I'm not even going to say it's biased. I don't think it is. I think they are the deepest conference in football this season. In 2022, the Pac-12 is the deepest conference from 1 through 12. I mean, take out Colorado, and really all 11 teams could beat anyone. Maybe Stanford this year is kind of down too. So take out those two, those 10 teams, it can really beat anyone. Um, And it's impressive, and and I think it shows the state of what these coaches have done. And when you look at the whole, my long-winded of saying all that, is when you look at SC against Arizona three weeks ago, because I think a lot of UCLA fans, it's the the brothers across, that probably looked at that and said, SCB to Arizona without four of their biggest players. They were out both receivers. They were out both two big defensive players. They still put up 40 plus Caleb Williams threw for four, 450 or whatever. Uh, even with his out receivers, our offense is much better. We're, we're healthy overall. We'll be fine. And then as you mentioned, 
those two extra weeks of being battle tested for Arizona. For those who don't remember, Jed Fish was on the Jim Morris staff here at UCLA. He knows UCLA. He knows the Rose Bowl. Obviously, this is a different team, different culture under Chip, but he knows what it's like to play under the bright lights of the Rose Bowl. And obviously, they came out to play. And Jaden Delora is just a special talent uh, that is so fun to watch. It was then fun to watch him against our team because it's frustrating when you can't slow a guy down. Um, but yeah, he's fun to watch. So let's let's po- t- talk positive real quick, Jamal, and then we can get to future outlook. Zach Charbonnet, another unbelievable game. I mean, the dude is just so good, so special. 24 carries, 181 yards, and three touchdowns. It's, it, I mean, every week it's the same superlatives. This guy is just so special, so good. And then also, we haven't talked a ton about it, but credit this offensive line, who has really become one of the top uh, run-blocking offensive lines in the Pac-12. Zach Charbonnet has a lot on his own, but these guys are mauling dudes on the, on the trenches and really creating holes and space for Sarbonnet to hit. So this whole unit, the whole rush unit, the scheme by Chip Kelly was still on full display. It was just unfortunate they couldn't utilize that and get the win. Charbonnet was his spectacular best, you know, really willing this team in the second quarter and the third quarter in particular. Ryan, you mentioned the, the 24 for 181, the three touchdowns. He also had another 38 yards receiving out of the backfield, 219 total yards, and just was the bread and butter of this offense upon which everything else is built. And it just shows, again, the the depth and maturation, the jump that this offensive line has made since the beginning of the year. When we saw them against Bowling Green on opening day to now is absolutely remarkable. They're a completely different unit and they need to get much more credit and love than they've been getting um, locally and nationally as well. It's certainly something that isn't lost on me. Charbonnet is such a special player, Ryan. He is probably going to get to 1,500 yards rushing in the regular season without playing two games. And if you look at the fact that he didn't really play the second half against Colorado, didn't really play the the second half against one of the tune-up games, he's really missed three games. Yeah, And for him to do what he's been doing is absolutely phenomenal. I had him at 175 carries over the course of conference season after that Colorado game. He's right on pace for that. Chip understands who his bread and butter is in these key moments. And I think the positive going into next week, even though it was a loss, we were all a little bit nervous about he was a little dinged up. Obviously, it wasn't serious. But to see him get 24 for 181 and know that he's going to be 100% going into next week, that is all the difference in the world for this UCLA offense because then you can go lightning with Keegan Jones. You can go, uh, you know, different sort of spread formation concepts with a Kaz Allen in the backfield. It plays off of all of those receivers. Bobo then gets involved. Cam Brown gets involved. Everything begins and ends with Zach Charbonnet. So to know that he's going to be 100% going into that victory bell game that in many ways is the greatest silver lining of all. Yeah. You know, his last five games, Jamal, last five games, 124 yards, 198 yards, 151 yards, 198 yards, 181 yards, and yep. nine touchdowns in those five games. So, I mean, insane, insane. And yeah, you mentioned the other game in mean, Colorado. He had nine rushes, ran the ball nine yeah. times against Colorado and still had over 150 yards and three touchdowns, I believe in that one. So um, special well, talent. Crazy line about that stat, and it was right after Colorado. Those five games you're referencing, and the the 124 was against Washington. So he's had four straight 150 pluses. Yeah, he has not hit 25 rushes in any of those games. He yeah. had a season high carries against Arizona at 24. So it's not like Chips even running him into the ground in these big games. He's preserving him, and I would not be surprised. If Charbonnet gets 30 plus carries against SC and Chip really rides them all the way to a back to back victory bell performance. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're going to have to if they want a shot to win this game, um, which I think they absolutely have a shot to win this game. So they're going to have to ride Charbonnet. And especially when he's averaging over those five games, you know, 7.8 yards a carry. And everyone knows the USC defense from back end to front end or whatever you want to call it is not a strong one. So uh, I don't think Charbonnet is going to run anything less than 7.82 yards per carry. So you, yeah, you want to see 30 carries from him and there's no way SC slowing him down in any way. 
last point about this. Well, I guess we'll finish with two points. One thing about an injury and then one thing about that final drive, Jamal, and then we can wrap up. I think it's, we know this, but I don't think because the statistics haven't been what a lot of people thought, but I don't think a lot of people realize how important Kazmir Allen is to this offense and him not playing against Arizona. We just talked about Charbonnet who had a fantastic game, but they weren't really ever able to kind of keep the Arizona defense on their toes because of not having that speed threat and that, that versatility of Kaz Allen. They have Cam Brown who's very similar, but he just has not been nearly involved in the offense as we thought he would this entire season. And we saw what Kaz Allen did against Arizona state where he, you know, ran for a hundred received for basically a hundred. I mean, he was so versatile in that game and not having in this, in this one was just a weapon for DTR and chip Kelly that you all of a sudden just take off a ton of explosive plays, but also just the elusiveness or the, um, challenge of the defense to have to respect what he can do. And so I think that was a huge thing that no one's really talked about. I didn't even get mentioned much on the broadcast, but a big, big loss that as good as Charbonnet is, and he is the bread and butter of this offense, they showed against Arizona State they can still run the ball without him, and that's not to discredit how good Charbonnet is, but I think this shows that Kaz Allen, and I'm, I'm repeating myself, but just the way the defense has to respect him means so much to how this offense ticks. Ryan, you said it so well. Kaz Allen is the ultimate chess piece for Chip. And the reason for that is, look, the modern game today, both college and NFL, in particular college, it's all about pre-snap motion to Mm -hmm. understand what the defense is running and then being able to adjust accordingly. And especially when you combine that element of pre-snap motion with the fact that now I know what you're running, I'm going to call something to exploit that, but then that domino effect then takes place, where if I get a big chunk play, guess what? I'm rushing to the line. I'm hurrying up. You're in your same defensive scheme. You have your same defensive personnel. I'm going to run another motion to see if you're going to counter, and I'm going to keep going. And the only guy that can really be such a threat in terms of pre-snap motion on UCLA's team is Kazmir Allen because you can line him up in the backfield and he can directly get the ball as a running back. You can split him out wide and you could get him the ball in bubble screen situations or you can hitch and go him and have him go deep. And so the combination of all of those things, throw in the jet sweeps, throw in some option routes, throw in all of these other horizontal elements And no other player allows Chip to get dialed in as a play caller and build a rhythm as a play caller than Kazmir Allen. In that sense of being able to build a sequence of plays and call a whole game, the most valuable piece and player and chess piece on the board for Chip Kelly is Kazmir Allen. And so it was very evident not having Kaz in that game where UCLA just didn't provide enough mystery pre-snap and enough strain on the defense where you knew it was going to be Charbonnet is going to get a a run or we're going to try and find a Bobo and a Cam Brown and they're going to guard it. It's just going to be a matter of whether or not those guys are good enough to get open given who they are versus who is guarding them. It's also why the only real surprise play the only real explosive play of the whole game through the air was the Hudson Abermel 51-yard touchdown, and he broke tackles, two big tackles, in the middle of that run to really turn that into a 51-yarder. Outside of that, UCLA really wasn't able to stretch Arizona vertically because Arizona was never, as you said, on their heels and never unsure of themselves of where the ball was going, and that was a direct result of Casimir Allen. Kaz has to be 100% going into that SC game, and I think he will be. I think it was a pretty significant precaution to keep him out. It came at a heavy price, but I'm excited about Kaz Allen being 100% for the victory belt. And I think, Jamal, where they we saw it the most, and I remember just thinking this as I'm watching it, was on that last drive yeah. to end the game. They get to the whatever 25, 22-yard line, and it's basically you know 20 seconds or 25 seconds left. Uh, goal to go essentially. And having someone like Kaz 
gives you the opportunity to throw it underneath because he can just make magic when the ball's in his hand and he's fast enough. And here, here's, we're talking about seconds here, right? So you have to, even if the player with the ball doesn't get out of bounds or doesn't get the end zone, we're talking about a guy that can save two to three seconds because of how fast he runs with it as of someone else who's slower. And I, I'm trying to like explain my, my thought process there, but say you, say you throw it to a Bobo for like a little five yard dig route, like in the middle of the field, his steps, his size, his speed, his, I'm not saying he's slow, but his non Kaz Allen speed, by the time he is tackled and brought down, it may have cost UCLA two to three to four more seconds. Whereas a Kaz with his quick lightning, like he could get those extra five, six yards, get down, they get the ball, they either spike it or they run another play. And then also just, it, it makes the defense say, okay, well, we can't play so shell in the end zone because if this guy gets the ball, he can make four guys miss and get in the end zone from 20 yards out. So I really saw it there as a, a huge loss that they could have used. And the last point I'll, I'll say on this, Jamal, and we can wrap up is on that last drive, you know, as good as DTR has been this year and he's had signature wins beating Utah, beating Washington. He's had those signature wins, but I don't think he's truly had that signature moment. He's had the awe inspiring plays, the hurdles, the, the juke moves, the standing over guys, the yelling, that's all been there and accounted for, but he hasn't had that signature play in his collegiate career in crunch time. And he had the opportunity in this one. He drove them down the field with no timeout. They get down to scoring position. Fourth down. Clock is going to expire. Bobo breaks free in the back of the end zone. DTR steps in the pocket, eludes a, a, a rusher, steps to the right. It was not an easy throw by any means, but there was no one within five yards of Jake Bobo in the back of the end zone. DTR had to just kind of loft it to him, had him there. They would have won the game. They would have salvaged the season, salvaged the ranking. DTR would have then had his signature. I know it's against an Arizona, but that last second game winning drive, game winning touchdown throw. And it's unfortunate that he just wasn't able to get that done. I know there's a lot of factors at play, but you had your best receiver open. The guy that you want to have the ball in your hands, your quarterback had it, had the opportunity, evaded pressure, and unfortunately just didn't get it done. Yeah, Ryan, it was a really tough situation. I love the point that you made about the differences between Bobo and Kaz in particular on that final drive. So not going to repeat that, but that was absolutely excellent. And yes, that last play, I think the rush came, he was evading it. He went inside, then went outside, then bounced to the outside. So you knew the heart was racing and pumping pretty hard there. And he wanted to sort of just laser beam that ball in there. But the reality is Bobo actually had another eight to 10 yards of end zone on that right side. And he had already broken. All you got to do is just put some air under that ball to the, the to the back right of that end zone and let Bobo just kind of run underneath it with soft hands, catch that ball, and you're one extra point away from escaping. Instead, he tried to laser ball it in there, and Bobo had to leave his feet. And the reality is even if Bobo came down with the ball, that knee was out of bounds, and it was going to be an incomplete pass. So that's sort of, again – that element, that last step where can DTR have that poise? Can he transition from chaos to poise in real time in a play? And mm -hmm. I think that's what sort of makes the elite ones, the elite ones and those elite quarterbacks who they are. And I think what you're alluding to here, Ryan, is he missed out on his Josh Rosen, Texas A&M moment where Gus Johnson and his iconic voice could say the legend of Josh Rosen. I, we were all waiting to hear the legend mm -hmm. of DTR. And hopefully, hopefully it's, it's a karmic situation where he didn't get, was, it wasn't able to sort of execute on it against Arizona. Hopefully he'll get his chance against SC and things will go a little bit better. But I think that was an excellent point. Yeah. And that's a great way to end it because Gus Johnson and Joel Klatt will be on the call at the Rose bowl, USC, UCLA this Saturday. Um, we will be there. We'll have the LAFB tailgate. All you Bruins fans, we'd love to say what up. Text us uh, UCLA to the number 31032. We'll, we'll give you all the info there. Uh, you can follow us or message us on Twitter at Ryan Dyer at LAFB, at LAFB Jams, or the main account at LAFB Network. Um, we'll let you know where we're at. We'd love to say hi. Love to hang out. We'll be doing live shows, giveaways. We'll be cooking barbecue. We'll be you know having beers. It's going to be a good time out at the Rose Bowl on Brookside Golf Course. So can't wait for it. Last thing, 
We've done a special mini series called the Victory Bell Selection Show. We are recording episode three this week, and episode four will be live at our tailgate uh, at the Rose Bowl, basically going into the history of the game, how we got to this point, the matchups for this particular game, and then obviously we'll do a full preview at the Rose Bowl on game day. So make sure to check that out. It's Victory Bell Selection Show. You can find it on YouTube, find it on podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts, and obviously on LAFBnetwork.com. So with that being said, go ahead, Jamal. And Ryan, the last thing I'll say is I know we're down, Bruin fans, but certainly not all is lost, and there's still everything to play for. The reality of the situation is if Oregon can beat Utah, in Eugene, uh, that game is going to kick off at 7.30. The USC-UCLA game will kick off at 5. If Oregon can beat Utah, UCLA, by winning out, beating USC and Cal, they own the tie breaks over Utah, over Washington, and would own the tie break over USC with a victory. They will get to Las Vegas in the Pac-12 championship game. So not all is lost. We just need to be Oregon fans for this week. And even though Oregon lost the game at home just last week to Washington to put themselves in this predicament, remember, Oregon won 23 consecutive home games before that happened. So the probability that Oregon will go from 23 straight at home victories to two straight home losses is pretty remote. So all that needs to happen is something that I believe likely will happen. And UCLA is back again in the driver's seat for an opportunity to go to the Rose Bowl. So still everything to play for in this victory bell game and all will be forgiven and all will be forgotten if UCLA can pull this one out. Absolutely. So make sure, I would say make sure to pack the house, but I, as of today, it's sold out. So the game is sold out at the Rose Bowl. Cannot wait to see 70,000 strong in that place. It's going to be a blast. It's going to be fun. We will be there. Make sure to hit us up. So everyone have a great week. We'll see you all Saturday. Be well, be safe. Talk to you.